Hey, thanks for coming by Tori Magoo 44. I'm here tonight with my friend Kevin Brady. Um, we, he has very kindly come over to help me with my computer. We had a huge snag with it and uh, he's been very, very helpful with it. So I thought, hey, let's make a video while we're doing some of the backup stuff. So anyway, hello Kevin, how are you? I'm good, Tori. Good. Good to be here. Good, thank you. Thank you so much for helping me with the computer. Mm -hmm. So why don't you tell the guys, uh, you were in Scientology when? From about late 88 until early 1990, I was on staff at the Boston Organization. Okay. It's a class 5 organization. It's not one of the military style organizations. It's more like a, uh, a bookstore with some, with some study services added. Good. So it's not the C organization. No. But um, what kind of services did they have at your, in the Boston? They, they trained people to become up to class 5 auditors where you uh, learn how to bring someone all the way up to what Scientology calls a clear. And then after that they would be shipped off to a C organization, like an advanced organization or flag to, uh, to get a clear certainty run down and then move on up through the OT levels. Good. All right. And what did you like about it and what didn't you like? Uh, what I really liked about it was actually the sense of esprit de corps that we had when I first started there. I liked the other Scientologists. I found them very interesting and intelligent people. Um, I had very, very, not close friends, but uh, people that I really admired who I thought were intelligent. Some were pretty well read. Some were completely ignorant. <laughs> but, uh, you know, it was, it was a cross-section of humanity. Uh, I've never found that Scientologists are easily typed. Right. And, uh, That's yeah, a good point. A lot of them, it's, it seems like half of them are philosophical, and the other half are just sci-fi fans who found it fascinating that maybe they could be just like some Heinlein character they'd read about or something like that. Interesting. You know, maybe, maybe you could be the stranger in a strange land. <laughs> you, True. You know, it certainly is a strange land. <laughs> so I was on staff. I was, uh, I was the course administrator when I first started out, and so my job largely consisted of putting quarters in people's meters so they didn't get tickets while they were on course, <laughs> maybe going and getting them their lunch so they could spend more on more time on course, uh -huh. calling people up to find out why they weren't on course. That uh, had to be a big job. Interviewing them to set them up so that they'd get a schedule so that they would meet that schedule and then they'd get in ethics trouble if they didn't meet that schedule. Oh. I was that guy. Right? And, and maybe I, I also kept track of their student points and would file them. So that was that was what that was all about, and then at night I would study dynamics and Scientology myself. And how did you like it? I really I, I enjoyed it a lot when I first started. Um, I had never had a job before. Like I'd had I'd maybe mowed a lawn or <laughs> you know. Uh, the, the so you were young. You were yes. a young man. I was eighteen. Right. And you know I'd, I'd worked at a convenience store, fast food place, whatever. I had gotten some years of college in, and so when I got there, I. I, I was there as a student. I, mm -hmm. I wasn't there for like a career. I didn't really realize that was an option in Scientology. I went to get trained as an auditor. Right. And I, I really wanted to help people overcome uh, problems that they had in their life. That Scientology terms unwanted conditions. Right? Yeah, that's kind of how I got into. Yeah. So then, what ha what changed that you're now out? And you've been out for some time, right? My number one beef was that it seemed that everyone else wasn't making pro progress. There were people there who'd been on staff for 20 years and weren't clear. People there who'd been public for 20 years and had never trained as an auditor at all. And that struck me as a major outpoint or problem, as Scientologists call them. Especially it. staff, right? Yeah, they should yeah. be trained. They should be clear. They should be OT. Why aren't they? You know. And it turned out that Usually it was because they were under so much stress from working really long hours and getting screamed at or, you know, performance standards that they couldn't meet. And then they would have to do some other job after they left their hours on staff <laughs> in order to pay their bills because they right. certainly weren't getting paid for no. their work on staff. Not really. No. And uh, so, of course, you were exhausted when you came to work. Now, I was 18, and at 18... You could have strung me along for five straight days without sleep, and I could be performing at the end of the five days probably almost as well as I started on the first day. Right. But there were people there who were in their 50s, and I imagine that with no sleep, those people were having a significantly harder time making it by the end of the week, and especially Thursday at 2. The stress oh, was just ridiculous. It, unbelievable. I had a battery that would go forever when I was 18, but 
I, I recognized that not everyone did, even when they were 18. Right. Know, not everyone was in good health like I was. Then. Right. So um, my, my big problem was the other staff was under major stress and having big problems just living their lives, just surviving. They, they had to move constantly. They couldn't pay their bills. The all, all only thing that they could spend their money on was food, and the food was terrible because if you try to stretch $50 for a family across a week, yeah. that's not going to make it. No. That's not going to make it. And, you know, they're always back, not able to pay their rent, living together in a communal format because it's the only way that you could possibly have an apartment. The stress was just unbelievable. And at first it didn't bother me. But over time I started to realize this is not the life I really want for myself. And if this is the life that staff members in a church of Scientology are leading, really, how are, how are they going to better the conditions for anyone else if they themselves lived, live in abject slavery? <laughs> you know, so that was my problem. And so I thought maybe... Maybe if they all started studying, they would be able to do their job better and survive better. And I started pressing to get other staff to study with me. Mm. And that got me in deep water because <laughs> nobody, a, a lot of people didn't want to be found out that they were moonlighting or doing another job on the mm -hmm. side, uh, had other fish to fry, doing other things other than Scientology. Right. So I was, I was always in lower conditions, which means, you know, uh, you're not in good standing. Right. When you, for anybody who doesn't understand lower conditions, Hubbard had a scale of ethics, and non-existence was in the middle, and anything below that was a lower condition, right. where you had to work up the conditions back to where you're even just a member of the group, right. and then you could... If, you, had, if you were in the upper conditions, it meant you were performing uh, your, your job statistics, which were performance measures of your job, were good, and you'd get uh, some pay. Right. Whereas if you were in lower conditions, you literally got zilch, no nothing, the, the goose egg. Yeah. You know, and that after you know a ninety-hour week, if you actually get that little slip that says zero zero zero, you will break out into tears. Yes. Because you cannot survive, and you right. know it, and you're going to have to beg from your fellow staffers who are in upper conditions. You know, will you will you give me five bucks so I can get through the week on right. curds Aww. and whey or whatever? You know, can I have a walnut today? <laughs> and then you're supposed to be like, if you're wanting to leave. Which I was. You know, right. um, when when you want to leave, you have to go through set checks, and you can't even pass a metabolism check on an e meter. You can't even get on. Well, hang the on, set checks for anybody new is where they're asking you what are your overts or bad deeds that you have committed. Because Hubbard said the only people who leave Scientology are leaving because they have overts or bad deeds. Right. So then they do these checks, and I was it's a like security checker. Yeah, I but I only became a security checker so that I could do FPRD in a co audit with which was false purpose rundown where you're clearing these evil purposes, which was another thing that, you know, Hubbard came up <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> which I did hours of. But security checking before you leave, how long did you do that? Until you had no more crimes to offer up. Until basically But you how could long pass. did it take you? I didn't ever finish. <laughs> See, that's how it and, is. And long. the major reason was because <laughs> I never could get enough sleep, right? And I never could have enough food in my system that I could actually pass the basic e meter check, right? So, and I, that's I, probably by design because they didn't want you to pass. And if I could, I might last five or ten minutes before I, I ran out of energy to be able to focus. Wow! And so then, you know, that it became a real drag, you know. So how did you finally leave? I finally just decided. I don't care if I'm declared suppressive. I don't care if I, I really, if I never see my wife again, I, I will have to face the fact that uh, I don't want to be here anymore. And my own sanity and my own ability to function in life is more important than uh, someone else's commitment to a cult. And isn't that amazing that it, it's it puts still me to that point to this day? And I've been out for ten years. You've been out even longer. Mm -hmm. Isn't it sort of amazing that you do come to that point where I you was have to? In love with it's my either wife. me too but with my either, husband, it but was it's either my sanity, your sanity and cult. freedom, or her cult. You know, it's like dig your head in the sand and forget everything you realized. And or I didn't think of it as a cult at the time. I, I, I just, didn't either. I thought there was a big no, no. problem. Maybe maybe a problem was with me. But of course, but I had to get out of there. Right. I had right. to get out for my own I was sanity the same. and safety. No, you don't think of it as a cult at all. I didn't for quite a long time after it's leaving. drilled into your head. We're not a cult. We're a religion. We're a religion. <laughs> We're good people trying to do a good thing, you know. And so anyway, I, I got to the point where I was pushed to the wall, and I said, 
you know, I have a baby on the way, I have to take care of my child, I have to go get a job. Something that pays right. a real salary, yeah. even if it's only $100 a week. Right. That's a certain $100 instead of a possible goose egg. Right. You know? And so I left, and the way I left was I stood up and said, I'm out of here. I'm not oh. doing one more, I'm not writing up one more overt or yeah. sin or crime or whatever. I'm not uh, pretending I have any more things I'm trying to hide. And for anyone lurking, listen to what he's saying. Yeah. I did the same thing. That's it. I, I didn't do life. the overt thing. I didn't. I'd you'll done scan your seven life. years of sex checking. So I was like, I done. hadn't. But I, I scanned my life from the time I was as early as I could remember, two years old, three years old, you know, the time that maybe, maybe, you know, did I pee outside on a tree or something? Like maybe that's why I'm you know, not able to perform to the way they want me to today, Aww. you know? And so I finally left, and, and on my way out the door, I was confronted by their security uh, and uh, basic admin person who was called the HCO, Harvard Communications Office right. person. And she got in my way and said that if I left, I would never speak to my wife again, mm. I would never be able to see my children, and that I would be damned, essentially, for, the, for, for eternity. For eternity. And it's lifetime after lifetime and after lifetime. And not only that, but they would make sure I could never work. They would make sure that, you know, there were problems for me for the rest of my life. And she was serious. And I, th I thought she was blowing smoke, but then she did it. Then she actually wrote the things up that would make it so that I couldn't speak with my wife. Mm. Wrote the things up that led to 13 years of disconnection from my children and mm. family. And, I mean, it seemed like a personal vendetta to me at the time, but uh, then I found out that this was policy. Right. This is what they do to anybody who leaves. They do. Don't. They do. So my advice is, don't get involved with these people. Right. They're very, very dangerous and sticky. And the people who are the da most dangerous and sticky are the ones who are most naive and don't realize that the, what they're serving was, is a, a monster that they think is a good thing. Yeah, that's they're the tricky thing. They you. believe that it's a good thing. So the people in, that's why I call it the Truman Show, because it's they're so isolated, and that's intentional, so you can't find out the facts, yeah. and you can't talk to anybody who left. Mm -hmm. But we know people are lurking. I know, because they call me all the time. Mm -hmm. And uh, tell them about the person you ran into today. Oh, we ran, I don't remember her name, but we ran into a nice woman on the street today. We were getting some coffee. Came out of the coffee You're in shop. Burbank. Yeah, and a woman came up and said she had seen Tori's videos and that she really liked them and that they, they really made her feel like someone understood that what she had been running into okay. in her own life with Scientology and why she was no longer willing to put up with it at all. Right. And, uh, you know, all you can do is, is shake your head and say, I can't believe I was involved and that I supported yeah. these people for whatever duration I did. Yeah. You know, I was very naive. I was very young. And it took me a short period of time to realize there was a problem and then a longer period to realize it wasn't me. Right. You know, it, it took a long time for me to go, oh, it's not just me. <laughs> it's not just me that's having a problem here. And, you know, and, and I'm not the first person who ever no. had this problem. No. And then when I found the Internet some, I don't know, three or four years later, I realized not only am I one of, I'm not one of the few. It's the few that are actually still in there. <laughs> They're the ones who, who are not following Bingo. their conscience. Right. They're not seeing what is right in front of their faces. Or they're There's seeing it 10, not There's 10,000 web pages either. out there of people who are telling their stories. Right. And really, there are 10,000 SPs out there who want or suppressive people, bad people, who, who don't want Scientology to succeed. It's just not the case. Right. The case is, it didn't work. And when it did it work, work, it worked to harm them. It didn't work, and... They don't. The, the pe most of the people out are standing up against the abuses that the Church of Scientology does, right. which is, you know, fair game, cutting off free speech, you know, medical abuse, breaking up families, just like you've spoken of, you know, that kind of thing. That's what most people out are speaking about. One thing that pointed out to me that I was human involved. rights violation. One thing that pointed out to me that I was involved with a cult early on, and I pushed into the back of my mind to, you know, to say, well let's see about this, we'll see if this is actually a problem or not, was when I, I, I first got in and I was reading about how if you're a PTS or a potential trouble source, you're a person who will do well in life and then do badly and, and that's because you're connected to people who push you down and don't let you succeed. And But what, what they have this like sort of initial sort of uh, 
training that you go through about this called a, a PTS case supervisor notice number one, PTS CS1. And basically what it means is you get trained to think that you cannot trust the news media about, right. you shouldn't even watch it, you shouldn't read the newspapers, you shouldn't read a magazine, you shouldn't talk to people who have bad things to say about Scientology. <laughs> right. You shouldn't, um, you know, basically... It's very self-censorship. You, sens you have to completely shut out the world that you're ostensibly there to serve. Right. You're there to fix problems and you're not allowed to see them. Right. You know, and it's just... It, at first, I was willing to just say, okay, this is, this is culty, this is weird, this is strange... Uh, you know, I should be able to turn on the evening news. Right. I should be able to watch any report about any group I'm involved with and not worry that it's going to be the one where they talk about the thing I'm not supposed to know. Right. right. I mean, it's just absolutely ridiculous. But you put it behind you when you're involved because you're so interested in possibly learning something of value that you don't want to risk the fact that you won't be able to learn about it because these crazy people won't let you learn about it if you also watch the news. Or, right. You know, it's just uh, really, really bizarre. And I put that off to the side for a while, and then when I got out, I was like, yeah, that should have been a major tip-off to me. <laughs> you know, it should have been a major tip-off to me. I think we all who are out have had, we, there's flags that you think of and go, this should have been a major tip-off for me. Right, and when they say, you know, you shouldn't hang out with your friends anymore. Right. You should stop talking to your mother and father. Uh, I mean, literally saying, you know, your father is involved in medicine, your mother was involved in psychiatry, and clearly they're evil people, so you should stop talking to them. And I was thinking, you know, I, I said, there's no way that's going to happen. But, but I well, should but have let also me said, just say I'm one thing. here. But let me just say one thing, because that isn't how it happens usually, and I, and I know you know this. They don't say, stop talking to your friends or family. They show you a policy that L. Ron Hubbard wrote, right? right? And what do you and, think it means? And, and the policy letter says... If you stay connected to these suppressive people or these bad people, it's going to harm you for the rest of your life, hurt your case game, blah, blah, blah. So you, by, uh, by yourself, come to your own conclusion. Because otherwise people lurking are going to go, well, nobody ever told me not to. But when you think about it, well, it's almost like it's, it's, it's after 30 years... They, they present you with a policy, yeah. and I'd look at it and say, well, yeah, but my parents aren't bad people. You know? right. And so then like, well, why don't you look at it again? <laughs> and see, see if you spot anyone in your life who you might need to handle this way. <laughs> you see, that way. I'm not saying you should disconnect from these people when it says handle or disconnect. Yeah. And you've tried to handle, right? So now what should you do? Yeah. Oh, maybe I should handle again? No, no, no. You should disconnect. And, and that is the unstated but very clear Very message. clearly stated. Everyone who's in the church knows that's what you do. Yeah. You handle or stop the opposition. Right. Or you stop talking to the person. And most people choose to stop talking to the people because it's too hard to handle. Right. And and most people whose children are involved with a very dangerous mind bending cult will tell their children, Get out of the cult And so when you're confronted with that, you say to the you say to yourself, Can I actually stop my parents from being so antagonistic towards my religion? And especially if they're educated people who know you're involved with a cult, they're never gonna stop being antagonistic. <laughs> they, they might wish that they could be better friends with you, right? but they're never going to say, oh, what you're doing is really good. Right, Unle because it's like walking, letting them. someone walk into fire and going, well, good luck, you know, I hope exactly. it's okay, you know, no. Yeah, I mean, my parents were very concerned, you know, and they, there was nothing that they felt they could do other than support me and say, we love you unconditionally. Right. We hope that one day you will realize you shouldn't be involved with these people. And right. All right, so now we got to go off, or it's not going to go onto YouTube because it'll be too long. Okay. But um, just briefly, you, you're doing great now, right? I'm doing wonderfully. I finished. I, I had stopped going to college in order to be involved in Scientology, okay. and it took 15 years really for me to get completely back on the rails. But I did finish my degree. Oh, um, I love that. I, I get to work and I get paid that. and have benefits. <laughs> and yeah. I get to eat. And, you know, have relationships with people that okay. aren't. Uh, that don't have a referee in the way who is has an ulterior motive. Excellent. Well, mm -hmm. thank you very much for doing this interview. Is there anything else you'd like to say to anyone? Hi. Stay <laughs> away from Scientology. <laughs> you can learn anything that's worth learning in Scientology from an external source that Harvard stole it from in the first place anyway. And it's often better. Yep. Okay, so peace out, everybody. We love you. Bye-bye. And hope my computer works.